This is the story of an island, a tranquil island, a lovely island. Its name, Bermuda, tropical outpost in mid-Atlantic. Discovered by a Spanish explorer, Juan de Bermuda, in the early 1500s, British settlers came here in 1609, and Bermuda became a crown colony 75 years later. decided to take that long planned Bermuda trip. Have I ever told you about our Bermuda holiday? It was wonderful. How well I remember our first breathtaking view from Gibbs Hill Lighthouse. Those enchanted isles spread out before us in the marvelous semi-tropical warmth and sunshine. The white roofed coral stone buildings of pastel pinks, blues, and greens. I came to Bermuda uh, quite a few years ago. Uh, just before America got into the war, uh, 60 years ago. And uh, not only was it a very beautiful place, but it was like a paradise, really. I'd never seen anything quite so beautiful. It's always fun to get off the traveled road with a crowd like this, or a swim and a picnic at some secluded beach. You'll find this romantic spot on the southwest shore of the island, below Gibbs Hill. It's an idyllic version of the old swimming hole. Unfortunately, there were some aspects that weren't quite as beautiful as the scenery. Having grown up in Canada, I had never seen water that color or sand, real sand, coral sand. Now, as far as the place is concerned, it, uh, it was uh, unlike Montreal in many respects. There was, first thing I was aware of is the racial segregation. It's, it hits you like a very soft punch, but still, it was uh, palpable. I mean, at, the, at that time, everything was segregated. Uh, restaurants, movies, even some churches. I remember the incidents in Devonshire Parish, the parish church, where, where black children went to Ash Wednesday service. And all the little white children from the white elementary school and, uh, went, all went in and sat down. They, all the black children were standing outside to wait for these little pale-faced children and, uh, to come in and take their seats. And then all the black children came in. And I thought that, hey, there's something strange going on. And I was about seven, eight at that point, perhaps nine. And I thought, well, I'll never come in here again. In the workplace, in, in terms of civil servants uh, and, and clerks in various government uh, jobs, it was always the post office, for example, only hired white or Portuguese. It, it wasn't uncommon to see an ad wanted secretary, white only. It, uh, that sort of thing was quite common. A young um, girl, I was connected with their family, she went to the Barclay and uh, at that time, they had just started a commercial course, and she took a course, uh, typing shorthand, and she looked in the paper one morning, Saturday morning, and uh, they asked for a secretary uh, or a typist, shorthand typist, without stating that uh, they wanted white only. She went down to apply. Girl, I suppose she's around 17, 18, somewhere in there. Applied for this job, and the lady looked her straight in the face and said, Yes, we are looking for a short end typist, but we're not looking for your kind, okay? So she had to just leave. Uh, knowing that, those facts, 
uh, I decided that uh, something needs to be done uh, around Bermuda. Bermuda's school system was a dual school system, one for the whites, one for the blacks. Dr. Gordon said it was bad for the whites and it was worse for the blacks. We used to leave the central school, Victor Scott, it now, it's now called, and we would have to go all the way to Front Street to this dom domestic science class. And I used to really get irate because our class would have to clean up after the white children and uh, all the demeaning kind of um, work that you, you could think of, our class was doing this under the guise of domestic science. And this was my first, um, I should say, um, inkling to the reality that this is not in a, in a book anymore. This is the real McCoy. Tea time is informal, like almost everything else in the open air. It was always a regular date with us. You will get the habit, too. It was an extremely embarrassing period for Bermuda when black tourists came from abroad and uh, they weren't allowed to, to, to be guests in certain hotels. We saw the enactment of the 1930 Innkeepers Act because we had people coming here, professional black people, who were insisting upon getting into the hotels for first-class accommodation. And um, they were rejected. Blacks were not permitted to darken the doors of white establishments. We were two communities, one black and one white. Bermuda was distinctive in its setup in that we had a large white minority and a much larger black majority. That was different from situations you found in, let's say, the West Indies, where you only had a small minority of whites. An oligarch is a group of people who run the government as if it's their own family affair. They had their tentacles in every aspect of Bermudian life. The oligarchy maintained absolute control in a devolution of power to oneself or to one's group. This special group happened to be all white men. The people who were the judges and uh, and the juries, and the people who were the policemen, the people who were responsible for the laws. The people who kept, who kept people in their place. In order to vote, you had to earn property. Uh, but then your property had to be um, assessed at a certain value. So you could earn a lot of property. If it wasn't assessed enough to vote, <laughs> you weren't able to vote. It was also limited in the sense that it affected white people. A large part of the white 
minority couldn't vote at the poll because they were landless. Some of these fellows have properties in nine different parishes and therefore voted for 36 different people. And of course the balloting was designed to help them because you see, they balloted over three days. You did uh, the eastern parishes, the central parish the next day, and the, the, um, the other parish, you know, the next day. Balloting over three days, a fellow could get to a report. You could shout to high heaven, it didn't matter too much. They would show the greatest sympathy towards what you were saying. They would go to any extent to set up a committee that would make you believe they're working towards a compromise and they would come up with a report with, with recommendations they had no intention of implementing. The established hierarchy at the time had used the Joint Select Committee as a means of getting rid of, of legislation. Or they would give it what they call the six-month hoist. That is, they would vote to postpone, debate, or any discussion on it for six months. And so you'd, even if you brought it back six months later, it really wouldn't go anywhere. The traditional thrust against prevailing conditions impacting adversely on the black people emanated from the pulpit, primarily the AME churches, and from parliament where there were any number of from two to seven and then 11 black members at any given time. Now what differentiated that traditional approach from the progressive group when this budding young intellectual, intellectuals started to impact on the scene was that they had, and they, the young people, had an action plan. Stan Rattery used to come here. He frequented our home. And, um, um, we talked a lot about things that were happening here. Stan is a dentist, and he and lots of the other educated kids were coming home, and they really were offended at the, you know, the way they were being treated. I left Bermuda to attend Teachers College at London University. On one occasion, we were invited to the theater by the Queen um, to sit in her box. Of course she was in prison, but these invitations came out all the time. And while we were in the box um, watching a play at this particular time, I said, here I am in the Queen of England's royal box. And you know that in my own country, I cannot sit anywhere that I like in a little measly cinema. I got involved in the social action because when I returned from college, I realized that there were many things that were wrong with life in Bermuda. Now, I realized that bef even before I went, uh, that there were things that were wrong, and, and we needed to make some changes. I was uh, in a mainly white country, Canada. I mean, I was able to... Uh, uh, I faced uh, far, far less segregation. Uh, over, over there in Canada, I was not, uh, I could sit anywhere in a theater, I could go to the best restaurant, and uh, I mean, I, I didn't face any of the kind of discrimination and uh, uh, that sort of thing that I found in my own home country. I got in all the progressive group as a result of a meeting with a good friend of mine, Stan Rattery. It was soon after I came home from my studies and I was preparing to go to work, and he asked me whether or not I would be interested in joining a group which was uh, concerned about social ills. And uh, I told him, I always said yes those days to almost everything. So I told him, yes, I, would, I, I, I wouldn't mind being involved. 
the members of that group were all friends. We would meet socially and obviously we would discuss the condition as we saw it in Bermuda. And the view was taken that we ought to do something about it. There were always these cells who were talking about doing things, talking incessantly. But when action came about, you got results. There are no language barriers here. No need to adjust to anything but relaxed and carefree living. Well, my sister-in-law had come back from Canada where she had studied at the University of Toronto. And uh, there was no theater, uh, live theater that we could go to. And since we uh, were people who liked the theater, uh, she was the instigator of a little theater group. We called it the New Theater Guild. And uh, we rehearsed and did workshops at uh, my brother's studio on Burnaby Street. He had a photographic studio, and at night, we used that, his premises. While we were having lots of fun doing this, the idea of being able to see the real thing, because some people had not been abroad to see the, the New York or see the real shows. And uh, we saw in the paper that a real group of well-known actors were coming into Bermuda. There was uh, a, an organization called the Bermudiana Theatre Club. And this club, would, they were going to bring in professional actors and actresses. They advertised it in the paper and we said, oh great, because you know I was really excited about this. But when we asked how we could buy tickets, they said, well, you can't. Because well, why not? You have to be a member. Oh, fine. We'll be members. And in the end, they said, well, you have to be of unmixed European descent. That was a subtle statement that colored people or those who had African blood were not welcome. <laughs> So we decided, now this is a start of something, now this is ridiculous. So we got together at my husband's studio in uh, Hamilton. We made up these placards saying, uh, Ralph Bunch not admitted to theater, uh, Jews uh, not admitted. We dressed ourselves up. I can remember the coat I had on. I wore gloves. I looked great. I asked for tickets, and uh, they sort of embarrassed. I mean, I, I, you know, they weren't used to being confronted face face to face, sort of thing. And but they had to state that the tickets. It was a private club, limited to only those of Euro European descent. So uh, we said, oh, I guess we'll have to do something about it. So we walked out and I said, okay. So then we started walking up and down with our placards. We had to keep moving, keep moving. And visitors came and wanted to know what this was all about. We would stand there and talk to them and they'd say, I'm not going to that theater, that sort of thing. And a policeman came and uh, he says, what's going on? And we explained to him, and he said, oh. So he went off and stood at the edge of the curb with his back to us, <laughs> hands clasped behind his back, as if he didn't see a thing. <laughs> 
because there is a story of the Canadian, the president of the Canadian University Women, I believe her name was Evelyn McLaurin, who was visiting, she was English and I think she was on her way to Canada. And she was passing by and saw us there. She'd been reading about it in the papers. She walked up and down with us trying to find out what this was all about. And she went eventually back to Canada. And she wrote many letters. Because of the letters to the colonial secretary uh, and the publicity in England, in London, uh, the matter was brought up to the House of Parliament. Letters were written also by Georgine. The governor always went on the opening night, which was for club members only. Eventually the governor was informed by the powers that be in England that he would have to attend only on public nights. This didn't go very, down very well. So in the end, they decided to open it up for everybody. We got together as a progressive group. Uh, actually, we were known as the Johnson Literary Society. The Johnson Literary Society was not really a society. It was a name that we gave the bank account that we had to be using at the Bank of Anti Butterfield and Son. And so I don't know whether there's still any money in there or whether they've closed it and destroyed it. We were looked at by the outside as a social group. We, we played cro croquet and other sorts, sorts of games. It appeared to be a social group. In fact, a couple of our friends said they had only joined because they thought this would extend the social life. But it was a type of society that uh, young people just back from college might want to be a part of, you know? It was, had no revolutionary uh, connotations, and so that, again, would assist the anonymity, which we felt was important. We were, were afraid at that time to do too much at Roslyn's because we found out after a while that the police were watching her home. And one Sunday afternoon we were there and we saw the police detectives, actually, coming up in that area, so we went outside and we started playing a game on the lawn. We realized that in order to do this, we were putting ourselves at risk, not only ourselves, but our parents too, because we knew that in the past, that any young person, upstarts as they call them, came to try to make any changes, they really tried to put the pressure on our parents by calling in a mortgage um, at just the drop of a hat, like give them a couple of days or something like that to get all the money that they had outstanding in the mortgage. So we wanted this particular group to be anonymous. And why we were anonymous? Because we took the view that people would probably not pay much attention to us in our suggestions if they knew who we were. Because essentially we were quite ordinary people without any, how shall I say, reputation in Bermuda. And therefore, you've heard the old saying in Bermuda, who do you think you are? And uh, on that basis, a lot of good ideas are rejected. Late evenings, we used to go into meeting and discuss strategies for making change in Bermuda.
Wilfred Allen. Now that does bring back memories. <laughs> he was an amazing man, an amazing personality. He was logical, he was loud, he was, but he was prolific in his denunciation of the oligarchy. That was the one thing that set him off. And even though he regarded me as being logical, on several occasions he regarded me as being rather naive and indeed illogical. But Wilford was Wilford, and I don't mean that in a, in a naive, sentimental kind of way. I'm trying to relate to you what, what he was, in essence, as a person to me. And not only to me, I suspect to many other Bermudians, because he was a powerhouse. And I tell you something, they had nobody in the oligarchy who could stand up to him. In fact, there was no, no one in the, in the confines of the black diaspora. That is across all social strata of Bermuda. He was... He stood alone in terms of what he believed. He was diametrically opposed to racial discrimination. He was diametrically opposed to control and manipulation. He was, he was an out-and-out out socialist, and he knew his socialism. The man went down deep, 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 deep into the very subsoil of, uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of those things that, that he believed in. We really saw eye to eye on most things. And of course, the topics that came up was segregation, uh, political empowerment of people. And we moved right along and we became very, very close friends, buddies. And I learned so much of Bermuda's struggle through him and then became associated with it through him. Eddie and Wilfred. Uh, became very friendly with a young man named David Critchley. We became a trio, Wilfred Allen and David Critchley and myself. We formed a sort of discussion group, and one of the things that they pointed out, which we realized was quite re relevant, that no change comes before the idea is placed strongly enough in enough minds to make a difference. We were successful in doing an analysis of the problem in Bermuda. We were quite aware that most of those in the group, if not all, uh, might suffer some kind of repercussions uh, if they publish something uh, like a book or pamphlet. It was a secret document, although, as Wolf would say, I don't see why we have to be secret about any damn thing. Anybody wants to... In fact, there were rumors that we were being monitored and people will be planted in the group. He says, let them plant whoever they want. And anybody wants to know anything, I will tell them. We decided that since Mr. Critchley was going to Canada, that uh, he could have it printed up there. While it was hidden and secret, in quotes, it did a lot. A good number of years later, uh, it was seen by some of the powers that were and they thought there was going to be some kind of uprising they were quite concerned about it and we just, we just laughed because we knew it had been out for several years The progressive group, in actual fact, had long-term and short-term objectives. The short-term objectives were to assemble a protest against the, 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 the theaters and restaurants. Uh, the long-term objectives were to get into various groups and, and also ultimately into government to influence government policies, uh, certainly those policies that related to race in Bermuda. It was started really as the development of a political force. We thought 
in the absence of any political party in Bermuda, that the way to make change is through political action. Each of the members had a portfolio. I had to worry about education, somebody had fisheries, somebody had um, uh, whatever, public works. And each, and each, at each meeting, uh, we would put together uh, a um, paper on some aspect of, of a specialty. They used to um, have the meetings, arrange the meetings, down at um, Roslyn and Ed's house monthly. And those days I was in, in the taxi, taxi business. And I know I would leave here and go and as far as Flats, the aquarium, park my car, and walk up to Town Hill, you see, uh, for fear that they, someone up there might see the taxi, give the number, and they get to know who this chap is. So that's what I used to do. Despite the fact that I was involved those days in so many things, I was teaching at the base, I was teaching night school at, at the college, the tech that those days was called. And um, so I spent a lot of time with the um, group uh, preparing for the, for the various activities that the group was involved in. We began courting and he would come to visit me and I noticed that he was coming late at night and late on weekends. I could tell that I was at the college, I could tell that I was at the base, but we didn't have classes during, during Sundays and Saturdays. And therefore, uh, I had to um, make up some reason why I was unable to be available. And, I, and it was beginning to get on my nerves because the first thing I thought that this fellow had someone else, and I'm playing second fiddle to that someone else, and that didn't go down with me. And as much as I was, I found myself falling in love with him, I wanted to break this thing off before I just fell head over heels, and he made a fool of me. So every time he came late, I built myself up to tell him, I'm giving you your walking papers. But I couldn't, I kept putting it off. And then one day he came and he said, I've got something to tell you. And I thought to myself, oh goodness me, now he's going to be the one to break the news to me instead of my having the pleasure to tell him goodbye. And he said to me, to my surprise, I want to take you someplace, but I can't tell you where it is or what's it about until we get there. The group was very careful about whom they took in uh, and uh, very selective. And so that... Um, because of the situation I was in, I put it to them to ask if uh, my fiancé could be a part of the group. Now, just because I was a member, that wasn't an automatic thing. The group was very disciplined. Uh, we couldn't accomplish what we did in any other way. Uh, so, therefore, it had to be discussed in the meeting. Now, I'm so surprised, I should say, by the fact that it's not walking papers time that I went along with him and found out that I was a member. I was asked to join the progressive group. But when I think of this, um, if he hadn't come all forth on time, well, it would have been history. I don't think that, well, we would not have been married. I would have dropped him, which would have been most unfortunate. On the, on the other hand, he claims that and he would have gone on with the progressive group, and he thinks I would have accepted it. No. Perhaps you'll fly to Bermuda in a few brief, luxurious hours. By air, you're in Bermuda almost before you know it. I returned home from school for holiday. Uh, from Canada and of course by that time I knew everything my mother didn't as far as I was concerned and one day I decided I was going to go to the theater to not the theater to the moving we call the moving picture theater and she looked at me as if to say what's wrong with you why would you go there it was the playhouse theater 
the Playhouse Theater segregates. And she says, they segregate. Don't you go there. And I said, I want to see Intermezzo. And I am going to the theater. She was very disturbed. But I went anyway. This I will never forget. Because of the way I felt. I walked in. I'd been used to Canada. In Canada, I felt free. Canada was such a different place. But when I walked into this theater, there were the blacks sitting on the side, blacks right down in the front, and blacks nowhere else. The middle, all white. I felt so uncomfortable. I was trying to stay there because I wanted to show my mother I was going to do what I wished to do. But I learned a great lesson. Don't do things when you know that the, what you're doing is wrong. The theater problem was one that people experienced all the time. Partly because frequently there were more people to occupy the, the, the colored section than there were seats in the colored section. And, and the white section would be left empty. Somebody would come to the door and say, two upstairs, and a white person who had just come, they could go upstairs. Now, you're, you've been in the line maybe about 15, 20 minutes, and that person would go ahead of you. That hurt me. In the 50s, we decided, a group of us, my brother, he was in the House of Assembly, and he was always speaking about segregation in the House of Assembly. And they decided that we were going to get together and go to a sit-in at the Playhouse Theatre. And we walked, we went there, we didn't let certain of our group go, because certain of our group had family, had a family, there were children, and the children would suffer because they had a mortgage. And the mortgage would have been, the bank would have called in the mortgage, sure enough. And so those of us who felt that we were secure enough thought we were going to go and sit in the center at the Playhouse Theater. We had one thing that we wanted to happen. We wanted to be arrested. We wanted to have headlines in the newspaper saying, such and such a group were thrown out of the theater and arrested because they would not sit where they were supposed to sit. So I can see us now walking into the theater and uh, into the center section, there were white people sitting there. They wouldn't move. We pushed in. We'd say, excuse me, we were very polite. We pushed in, excuse me, excuse me. They kept their knees quite, quite where they were. And we sat and we waited. We waited and waited to be arrested. The manager at the back, I think he knew us and he knew he wasn't gonna have any trouble. He gave a signal, leave them alone. So we weren't arrested. At one of the meetings, Rudy Commission reminded us that we had discussed somewhere along the line a boycott and that perhaps now was the time to do it. First of all, we determined that we would have a boycott. And then following that, we were lucky enough to have uh, people capable of getting the address lists for the Somerset Cricket Club and the St. George's Cricket Club, which was pretty vast by anybody's judgment and therefore we could send letters to every one of those people on their mailing list. Although we had sent out thousands of letters, but we were still concerned about it not reaching the majority of the people. But we didn't have to worry about that because the Royal Gazette printed the letter to jeer us. Well, but they didn't realize they facilitated our particular objective of reaching the masses. The idea was that we had to get a message across to the media on the appointed day that in order to destroy or 
disrupt this business of segregating people in the principal theaters in Hamilton, the, the way to do it was to boycott them. It just so happened that um, while I was in, um, at Center, Center Fax, uh, as part of the cooperative movement, all of the techniques that I needed for the progressive group, I learned uh, at, uh, at college. Uh, when it came to putting posters together, when it came to stick, half to stick them on the walls, when it came to um, mimeographing, uh, when it came to doing these things efficiently and quickly, uh, uh, I, learned, I learned all those techniques while I was at college. Once the group decided to have a boycott, uh, they realized that they needed uh, mimeographed a machine to uh, make up the posters. Well, nobody in the group wanted to go out and purchase this machine for fear. It could be traced to them. We used to take in um, guests at that time, and it was two Canadian leaders that were here. They came in for a week. I approached these two ladies and I told them, listen, I explained to them what is happening here in Bermuda, and they saw the need of this, that yes, you really need one, because that is not right for black people to be treated in this manner. I took them to town, really, and uh, my taxi then purchased this machine, and then we were able to take it to our meeting. I used to write the handbills and the um, posters, and on this it just said, do not attend the cinema. If you want to desegregate, do not go to the cinema. As it drew closer to the time, uh, we, we uh, posted uh, uh, notices on the various telephone poles and the trees and that sort of thing. When it came to the night before the event is to start, we did it in a very precise manner. We divided the island into zones with at least a couple in charge of each zone, and at a specific time, 10.30 as a matter of fact, we put up uh, all the posters on the electrolyte pole. The man who was due to go with Stan did not show, and Gerald, of course, had just come out of the hospital, and I, of course, was very pregnant at that time. Nobody wanted me to go. Stan said no, Gerald said no. I said no, I'm going. So I went with Stan. And the posters were, we started here at Scar Hill and went right over to Bowes. And every time we saw a car coming, you know, we were dashing, Stan would dash back to the car and just so no one would know who was putting these posters out. Bermuda was a quieter time then, and at 10.30, people were starting to go to sleep. So, you know, it was not too difficult to put them up without people seeing us do it. We were swimming down Don Richardson's swimming pool, swimming hole, Don Doc Hill. And brother came down with this poster thing, saying this is put out by the progressive group. I said, well, who the hell is somebody who's trying to imitate the Brotherhood Association, the Black Brotherhood, which was my organization, which most people didn't know about anyhow because it was a secret organization. Not, not a witchcraft, secret society type of organization. It was just an organization that had, that had all of the, uh, all of the, the structure of, of, uh, of an organization of black men who were seeking ultimately to take power in Bermuda. And we had 80, 90 guys together and we met and we kept it among ourselves and it remained so to this day. Black people are going to boycott the theaters. That was big stuff, man. I mean, 59? Big stuff. Even an election probably wasn't even bigger than that because this probably involved more people, more younger people in particular. Well, we went in town and 
there was a good congregation of people. They were quite excited and quite serious. Uh, there, it caused a certain amount of anxiety, probably a great deal of anxiety, among uh, the powers, if I can call it that, uh, who felt they were already discussing these things. That particular Monday night, I take for granted that if you're boycotting, you stay away. That's my, my interpretation of boycott. But when I read the newspaper the next day, which was Tuesday, we said that all these people were around by the theater, seeing who went in, who was going in. I said, my goodness, that's where I should have been. Tuesday night. I was there. I, I said, "Well, I'm going. I'm going down to see what it's all about, and do a bit of um, do a bit of picketing. You know, do a bit of walking up and down." But it wasn't until you know things start of you know things were a little easy. So I saw the opportunity. Public speaking, it wasn't something that because I had been. I think I, I don't know where was I in trade unions, but I was pretty good. So I could I could take her a crowd. A crowd didn't mean anything to me. And I think I used it up. Seeing the crowd, I start to address the crowd spontaneously. Nothing actually planned, and you know the people took to it, and it was a good thing. It kind of um, it kind of galvanized people. People, you know, the interest. When I'm saying as far as being overly concerned about them. Um, no, who's going in the theater? That wasn't a concern. It was concern about, oh, what's the message here? What's the plan? Who, how things are being planned? We had a meeting. We had a meeting down Doc Ellen's mama's horse table that was eventually turned into a house, <laughs> living accommodation, a, a, fix, a fixed abode. And I said, Tootie, Doc Ellen, oh God, I remember it now. He had one of these recording machines. You know the ones that went around and around counterclockwise and uh, clockwise and counterclockwise. And he said, Tootie, you gotta speak. You, Tootie, you gotta, gotta speak. He said, because last night Doc Lynch spoke, you know. But Tootie, you've gotta get out there. But I knew that it kind of needed a more powerful kind of shouting preacher's voice. That's, that's where I came into the picture. But, uh, but we couldn't hear Doc, and it was probably due to the fact that Jungle Bunny and all those guys, why they had this technical expertise, and it was that. He said, listen, we'll use Reed's car, the battery. I'll take my biggest speakers down here, take my mic and everything down here and set it up. So... That's what we done. The next night, these brothers, Jungle Bunny, I, I knew him by another name. We didn't, we didn't always call him Jungle Bunny. Robert! Robert! The guys brought a car up there on the top of the steps, and they had a thing hooked up to a car battery. This is, ju this is Jungle Bunny's invention. And Doc Allen and all those guys, and Kingsley Simmons, and, 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 and Porky Weeks. You know, and Buster Samuels, the guy that used to, what do you think the guy's doing, you know? And all of those brothers were out there, man. Then they pushed his microphone in front of me, and there was this booming sound that kind of overwhelmed the cry, and there was this tremendous clapping. I called the managing director of the board, the Honorable James Pierman, better known as Jim Pierman, and asked him his reaction to the boycott. And uh, I was um, trying to be uh, not to appear as if I was in happy about what was taking place. And he said, oh, well, you know, it's a, just a storm in a teacup. The black people need their entertainment. It will be over in a day or two. It will blow over. So as soon as he said storm in a teacup, I knew I had him. So I went along with him. <laughs> I saw my headline story right there and then. Came out storm in a teacup. Hell, they don't know what a teacup is. They think a storm is a hurricane. A storm is a tornado, a hurricane, and a typhoon, and a fire. You understand, brother? And I mean a forest fire all wrapped up into one. Now that's a storm, and you can't fit that into no damn teacup. I was down there with Hilton and my sister-in-law, Carol, and our cousin, Eva Robinson, 
we were sort of always in on these things. And we started listening and we realized that the words were quite familiar, particularly in the form in which they were being delivered. And we realized that somebody was reading from the book which we had planted <laughs> several years before. It was Kingsley Tweed who had the courage and uh, heroism at the time to go public to read this actual document to the people who were gathered on Church Street, etc. And it was a really very unusual uh, development. He read uh, from the document because the document dealt with the limited franchise, segregation, and discrimination. It was a, an almost religious, deep spiritual matter with me, because I thought that it was inhuman to deny me the right to vote when I possessed such immense capacity as, a, as an individual and, 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 and in a broader sense as a people. <coughs> and, 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 and so any protest movement in Bermuda that was seeking to alter the status quo would not have been a proper, if you like, meaningful, sensible public or private discussion without the sentiment that I suspect most Bermudians felt with regarding the, the voting rights issue. He was the man who really actually held up the document. It was no longer secret when he had it. And so there was a continuing uh, linking of what we had done, and that took years. But then when the right individual, that is Kingsley Tweed, came along, he had in hand something he could show the people. It was not Mark Antony reading <laughs> Caesar's will, but it was a very important act and produced terrific results. He had a call for the ministry. These reverend gentlemen know, for that matter. Uh, and this natural ability to address a crowd, to bring in some scripture and some down-to-earth quotes excited the crowd. He talked and he talked and he invited interpolations. You know, he'd tell the people, people would say, yeah, 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 like you get an amen in a church and that sort of thing. And they just egged him on. Actually, there was greater entertainment outside of the theaters for all comers than uh, you could have gotten inside the theaters was live, unrehearsed, and it was good. It's not just about the cinemas, it's about a larger entity where you can quantify your protest into a political reality, into a social economic reality, and take control of your lives, our lives, take call of control of Bermuda. Not just about, so it was entertainment, but it was serious entertainment. Had we gone a step further, we would have had a burn-down situation in Bermuda. But you know, we, 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 it was controlled. And, I, and, and the people with the posters were, hell, they, they, they almost paled away into insignificance because we started making our own damn posters. There wasn't as, there wasn't as professionally uh, uh, done, as, as accomplished in terms of printing, printing material or readable material, but they were there and we put them up in broad daylight. It was a defiance, it was a rebellion against this kind of absolute power control freakery, the oligarchy. Parliament was sitting, and uh, things had intensified. And Jim Pyrman, who was also a member, well, the 40 thieves were everywhere, and they owned everything. So he was a member of Parliament. And when the black members um, called for some action, he said, 
I will not be coerced by a bunch of hoolums into doing something that I intend to do anyhow. He said he intended to open up a new theater which would be totally desegregated, but nobody believed him. So that was more fodder for Kingsley Tweed. <laughs> Kingsley said, oh, you call us a hoodlum, huh? Well, I'll let you know that it takes one to know one. We knew that, that if, we, if we burned Front Street down tonight, you know, then we would have lost, lost our cause. It would have been detrimental to our cause. We were sensible, we weren't stupid, you know. And so all that crap there about hooligans and, and jailbirds and, and hoodlums and, and uh, people trying to force us to relinquish control, that, that didn't matter to us because we knew that he had to relinquish control. And we knew that ultimately, that eventually, if it, um, ultimately, that he would have to concede, not because we had nothing to concede. Kenny Evans and those boys were able to, you know, able to kind of control the crowd, get the crowd, um, you know, get the crowd, because um, you didn't want people to um, start misbehaving, and those boys were able to do that. The whole three nights were very civil in the sense they had no type of events that was disrupt disruptive, right? Was was nothing like that. Was very orderly. And as a matter of fact, Kingsley was pruned to emphasize, right, that this is a peaceful demonstration, right? The people who just come out to show support, right, for the idea of desegregating all of the segregated places that was in Bermuda. There was also an interesting thing happening. Somebody had organized a group of young men who didn't have a reputation for the most gentlemanly or gentle manners. And they were proudly walking up and down with the placards saying, no violence, please, <laughs> which was quite, quite something to laugh about. I knew that there was this core of black men, this solid mass of black strength and sweat and stink, this almost emasculated eunuch who had no political power or influence. I knew that he was there, but I know that he had big muscles and John Beaver and Sonny Boy Paul and all those boys, Whoopi Nisbet and Piggy Dale and Barley Bop and Ponce Goda, Ponce Manchester, they were all there, and you know, and, and, and somebody eventually said, here comes Marsh. And somebody said, Marsh, if you touch Tootie Twee tonight, you know, they kick your black son of a bitch in the manga box straight back to Bridgetown, Barbados, you know what I mean? And Marsh disappeared with the white guys, English policemen, and they all disappeared in, into this, and they started on the periphery and became peripheral people on another orbit because we were in our element. The people did show their solidarity, and they came out in force to see what was happening. Then finally, after about three or four days, they had to close down the cinemas. Oh, we were most jubilant at that time, along with the um, people of Bermuda, because we had at least achieved one goal. The recorder and my office there was a nest for all comers, um, including some of the theater, 40 theaters establishment people, one of whom came to me and tried to strike a deal. We want to set up a committee, or we have a committee set up, we want some dialogue. You know who these people are, let's see if we could get somebody to come over to the home of the Attorney General in Fairylands and see if we could work something out. They didn't have anything to negotiate. Our objective was clear. Desegregate the cinemas. And so when he came out and told me we want to negotiate, we said, go to hell. 
negotiate. You didn't negotiate with us when you wanted to segregate the theaters and the churches. What the hell do you want to negotiate now? You know, you know, make the concession. And we said that publicly. There was always somebody in the background giving directions, you know? Somebody saying, look, why don't you do this? Look, we're gonna do this here. But um, um, those people in the background, their advice was good and we just followed their advice. We sat down and rough all the plans for this for these motorcades and uh, made, the, made the information public. Now we didn't go to the press on that occasion, we just had a, 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 our drop man who was uh, Gerald Harvey. I left Roslyn's and, uh, with a bundle of uh, posters and uh, they were having a meeting up at, at the um, City Hall parking lot and there were so many people, it was hundreds of people and the only way I could get rid of those posters was to get in, this, get in the center and just quietly drop them to my feet and then walk off. And I heard someone <laughs> say, what is this? What is this? And everyone went in that direction and they picked them up. And before I knew it, they were just passing all these posters out. And that worked. <laughs> I sat in the car for about 15 minutes speaking through this microphone and I had papers in my hand and I got out of the car and then I became more open and more robust, more rigorous, r rigorous, you know, uh, more, more to the point and reminded the people of St. George's and St. David's that this boycott uh, and the protests were here to liberate them from the political uh, uh, indiscretions of, uh, of, uh, of the of the of the rulers of Bermuda. That's how that went. It was a rather successful meeting. Big motorcade set out as directed by the street corner crowd went to Somerset. Uh, it was held at the Royal Naval Cricket Field. We eventually got to Somerset. We emerged in front of the street where there was a Portuguese gentleman having a, a kind of a supermarket thing, and all and and they were all there these Portuguese with the shop windows barred because because the word reached got there before that it was going to be coming to break up Somerset you know no we were we were, we were simply inviting the people of Somerset to come and join the, the part of this progressive movement you know of, of protests and demand you know to come and share in our aims and objectives then they went back to Hamilton and they said we are going to St. George's the next time 5,000 people we want to get to St. George's. That was what they had asked for, but they certainly would have got twice as many. They knew that they had no alternative to desegregating. So rather than make it appear as if they had yielded to the protesters by opening the theaters desegregated from a given date, they decided they were going to have a circuitous route towards the same objective. They decided that they were going to open up the hotels. Preemptive move, which worked. So it came out, news came out. We had a stop press item in, the, in our paper, a stop press. Castle Harbor Hotel management have instructed their people not to turn away anybody and so on, etc. So the word went out that um, the hotels had desegregated, restaurants had desegregated, and that all public places in Bermuda would open up desegregated.
I think it's important to uh, add also that uh, the whites did not realize uh, just how much uh, the blacks in this island hated the segregated system and uh, how much they were just uh, looking for someone to take the lead uh, such as was done by the theater boycott. We certainly proved that we were able to influence the public. Uh, and um, it also started the um, domino effect. It advanced the cause of the working class movement into a solid mass organization. Came out of the boycott. People would deny that, you know? Uh, but it came out of Mazambo. Do you know what I'm trying to say? I don't want to deny anybody their huge contributions. It came out of Ira Phillips's pen of protests at the Bermuda Recorder. It, it came out of Hilton Hill, you know, speaking with a sense of purpose and decency about the possibilities where Bermuda could or could not go. You see, there's one thing that Kingsley said that was very significant. He said, the people who draw the plan the architects of the building aren't necessarily the ones who build the building. So he was projecting himself and prayers and among Jungle Bunny, the Doc Lynches and everybody who had the courage of their convictions to speak up as the builders of the building. As much as we were publicly a lot of other things, and privately, the progressive group, uh, at least it felt to me that this was our organization. And I felt that we could preserve it better if we remained uh, secret. The people who got up and spoke also did a sterling job uh, because they produced a spontaneity that we, we had not anticipated, a level that we had not anticipated. And um, they could take the heat off of us uh, because we, we felt at one point we felt that we might have been exposed, uh, they might have caught on to us. And, and so, we sort of think they, they, were, they were looking in the wrong direction. Okay. And the other thing is that all of those persons who spoke publicly, you know, suffered um, economically. And that's a reality. That's a reality of the time. The thing I regret most is that I didn't stay in Bermuda. Perhaps I was too much of a coward. I ran for my life. I was running for my life. And the man said, we got a bullet with your name on it. And I thought, well, hell, I ain't gonna let you shoot me. But I regret not having stayed in Bermuda for that one principal reason, that I never cast a vote in a general election in Bermuda. But I applaud all those who did. We were Bermudians, and we had brought about our own changes. That this was important for the youth to see that uh, the changes that took place was not something that was opposed, not something that was imposed, not something that came from abroad. It was simply a group of students, people who have just come from school, who decided that they want to make changes. And uh, therefore, I was finally convinced uh, to um, make the activities of the group fully um, public. They picked up the spirit of the entire movement and kept it going in a most effective and controlled way, which made a tremendous impression on everybody. And it wasn't long after that, because of the tremendous support, uh, the whole affair turned out to be one which brought people together like they'd never been brought together before. And it really became a people's victory.